it here. And, um, you know, at first, uh, I'd like to say, you know, this merchant meeting and the work that we do, Lancaster City Alliance, uh, would not be possible without the generous support of our legacy sponsors. And uh, actually, our presentation today will be made by one of those sponsors, um, Penn Medicine Lancaster General Health. So, um, so um, thank you, T. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you um, in a bit. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that um, this will be recorded uh, for posterity, and uh, and please uh, keep your um, please keep yourselves muted um, unless you are asking questions. Um, again, um, please feel free to use the chat uh, the chat box uh, for questions. But again, um, with this size group, uh, I think we can have uh, more of an open dialogue, uh, which is fantastic. Um, you know, one thing I, I wanted to do quickly, uh, and um, uh, Alex just waved to everyone, uh, Lancaster City Alliance has a new team member um, started last week, um, Alex Othoffer, who is waving. Uh, Alex is our new programs and outreach coordinator, so you'll be hearing and seeing um, from him uh, uh, much more uh, in the future. So Alex, uh, welcome to the team. Everyone applaud for Alex. Yay. Very great. All right, so on to our special presentation. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> On to our special presentation. Uh, you know, it is my pleasure to uh, to welcome um, our speakers today uh, for a COVID update, ensuring a safe workspace. Um, now that there is actual light at the end of the tunnel, um, this is especially timely. Um, so um, our friends here from Penn Medicine and Lancaster General Health will share important safety measures um, to keep your staff and customers healthy. Um, this will also include an update on the state of COVID in our region, um, infection rates, um, therapeutics, and vaccinations. Uh, with us today, we have Nicole Myers, who's the Manager of Occupational Health, and um, T. Drummond, who is um, Executive Director of Corporate Partnerships, and also uh, our Board Chair um, of Lancaster um, City Alliance. So uh, please help me in welcoming uh, Nicole and um, T. And... Uh, we will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Marshall. Thanks, everyone, for having us. I appreciate that. Dave, you're going to do the slide turn it for me, right? All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for having us. Uh, you, yeah, and, um, I'm going to do the bulk of the presentation, um, and Nicole is going to, is going to um, finish us up with some just some key safety and well-being concerns. But, um, yeah, we are at, we are at a, a pretty pivotal point right now with the COVID journey. And I've been giving these talks throughout the county to employers and local chambers, um, even uh, our partners at SCORE and other, I've been giving these throughout the year. And um, it's getting to be pretty repetitious lately, but with a lot of updates because things are moving so quickly. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we present this to you. A lot of this information it can be can be gotten by any one of you through various websites. I have a, a page on here that has all of the key links that you want to uh, tap into to get this information. But um, I think it's important for us to give you, first and foremost, an update on where we're at with COVID because it is still unfortunately alive and well in our community. And then I'll touch on what we're doing therapeutically and then through the vaccines. And then I'll hand it over to Nicole to talk about some of the safety measures that um, you can continue to put in place as we move through. All right, Dave, let's move through this. Uh, we'll move through the first couple of slides kind of quickly. Let's go to the next slide, Dave. So these are, these are kind of elements that we know. Um, you guys understand this. I'm sure you've heard this many, many, many times. You know, we understand this vir virus. This virus is not an airborne. It is a droplet virus, which means that it needs to piggyback on the droplets that we transmit. So um, that's why the point of the six feet, that's why the point of the mask. Um, and the key issue with this virus all along, and I know most of you have heard this, is the infectivity prior to symptoms. It is highly contagious, highly, highly contagious. And, um, uh, that's, and even the new variants are even more contagious. So that's the problem. That's why all the precautions are absolutely necessary because once you identify symptoms, you've probably infected many people prior to this and it's hard to wrap our hands around it. Go to the next slide, Dave. So this is, this is the concept of masks and this illustration on the right-hand side really displays that well. Because remember what I just talked about is the difference between droplet and airborne transmission. 
airborne transmission means it freely moves through the air, like tuberculosis or others, right? The droplet transmission, this is something that has to re rely on the droplets. Those droplets cannot move any more than the six feet distances, right? So if you keep the masks on, the mask will filter the droplet, which filters the virus. And that's why the masks are so critical to use. Now, for, for and I'm not sure where everyone stands with their um, concern with, with the, the, the virus and masks, but just to give pretty concrete evidence of the effectiveness of masks, we have almost zero flu this year, zero. And, and it is all because of the distancing and the masks. Um, it just, it also speaks to how, how contagious this virus is, even despite that, despite the fact that we've been able to virtually eliminate the flu this year, the virus for COVID is still highly contagious and impacting us. That's how bad it is. And there's another slide that I kept out of here, which shows relatively how infectious and deadly this virus is to other viruses we've had historically. Um, so it's, it's, it's very bad, um, but I, I spared you guys that because I know you've heard this you know, many times throughout the year. Let's go to the next slide. So now we're gonna dive into where we are today. And this, I could literally update this thing every day and things are moving so quickly. So you have access to this. This are, our state has done a fantastic job about keeping, making this very transparent with respect to how bad things are throughout the, the uh, state. And they break it down by county. You can break it down by day. You can, there's, a, there's a, I mean, almost infinite number of, 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 of data you can draw from this. So let's go next slide. And these are the, some, of the, some of the slides that I've been putting out um, on a regular basis. So the first thing I'll point out, that upper left-hand corner is a key, that highlight. Our positivity rate is 18%, which is enormous, okay? We've done a great job of controlling the spread and we do a phenomenal job of now treating it, but it is still very, very active. Remember the World Health Organization trigger on, on when you really have a problem is 5%. If you have greater than 5%, it means you're either not testing enough or you've got a serious outbreak. We still have a serious outbreak. So what I'm showing you here, this is up through uh, the 15th when I drew this data. Um, so two days, two days ago. Uh, so I have two inserts here. The insert on the left is, is Pennsylvania overall. And the one on the right is Lancaster, very similar trend lines. And you'd see this in every county in the state if you looked at it. The thing that I want to point out, I'll, I'll break this down a little bit, is you'll see in this, in this upper, in the first area, this left-hand side, that's what happened in April and May when we didn't even know what was going on. And we, we really thought that, that that spike was going to be exponentially higher. So there was good control. Remember back then, remember back in April, all we talked about was flattening the curve. And we did it, right? We flattened the curve. Over, all through the summer, we did a great job. And then we knew it. We knew when the winter hit, we knew that we were going to have that spike. And it took off like a rocket in November. And November, it just it rose crazy, like way beyond what we thought was going to happen in April, um, which is why there was so many um, strict measures taken uh, publicly uh, to control the virus. So you see how we went through. I think it was December 22nd when we hit the highest uh, level. And then it started coming down after the holidays and the new year continued to trend down. And you can see there, like this is a, a dramatic change, which is why everyone's so optimistic, but there's a lot of caution here. So I want you to pay particular attention on what's happened in February, February into March. You see how it's flattening there? It's flattened on that right side of the trend line. It's, it's flattening at a very high level relative to where it was in April. Yes, relative to the spike in December, it's a lot lower. <clears throat> it's at least double to triple where it was in the summer. It's very significant. And it's at least double what it was back in April. So we're worried that this is, yes, we've flattened it, but it's flattened at a, at a, at a pretty high rate. So we're watching that pretty closely. The Lancaster trend on the bottom is very similar. You can see that for the most part, we flattened the entire duration of the of the virus until we got into that November period. And then you can see how we as a community really flattened off. We didn't get that like huge spike and decline that, that kind of you know upside down V 
we got this kind of flattening, this rounded out top, and then got into that flat. So we we did do a nice job in our community of controlling that spread through the through the end of December, end of January. Um, but it, we still have that same flattening um, going into March um, that we have to be very concerned about. Let's go to the next slide, Dave. So this just tells you what's happening here in a hospital. So in the hospital, and I only have from, the, from, from February 8th until the 10th, and you can see that dramatic decline. If I showed you the whole trend line through, through the winter, you'd see, I mean, it was significant. We were well over 100 cases in the hospital um, on a regular basis for a long time. Um, so this is, this is a really welcome sight to the county. Um, and frankly, our staff and uh, too to get some some rest and and get back to some degree of normalcy. But the same thing's happening here. You look at that right side in March. You know, yet we're flattening out, and the numbers are low. Which thankfully, that's fantastic. But but what we're what we're concerned about is there's another volume here of COVID recovered. These are these are the new cases, but there's another one of COVID recovered. Those that are that have COVID that are still in our hospital. But that whole, you can see it's kind of like, it's flattening and then it even has an upward tick to it. So we just gotta watch. So the, the reason why I'm putting these out there is we've gotta remain vigilant. This thing can get away from us real quick if we get overly confident because we're not where we need to be yet when it comes to the vaccine. It's gonna take a lot of time. Um, and I'm gonna go into that in just a little bit. Let's go to the next slide, Dave. This is something that um, I've been putting out there for the year. And these are two different slides that I can draw from the governor's website. I'll start with the right side. The right side is the death rate. And the death rate, as, as everyone pretty much knows, affects those greater than 70 years old. Um, they're the most at risk. And, and that's, that's very true. But I really pay, focus people on the left one, on the case rate. The, the case rate volume is pretty flat between ages of 20 and 60. So what that means is the virus doesn't care what, what age you are, right? It doesn't, it doesn't care. It's, it's gonna infect everybody the same rate. The other part that I wanna point out is the 70 and above aren't getting it from 70 and above, right? The reason why the 70 and above are, are dying is because the 20 to 60 aren't controlling the case rate. That's where we have to affect it. We can't, we, we're, 70 and above are doing a, a great job of controlling their spread. The issue is the younger group. That's the group that we have to take measures on. That's where, that's where the core of the, case of the virus needs to be controlled. Let's go to the next slide, Dave. This is the death rate, and uh, there's a couple stories here. And you'll see the peaks match what I talked about before with respect to the case rates back in April and then November, December. And you can see those peak times and how significant the peaks were. Um, you'll, you'll see that the, remember, remember how significantly different the peaks or the case rate peaks were in November versus April. November was like so much higher than it was to, to April. <laughs> now, November is higher, but not as much on the death rate. And that's because essentially the death rate, we're able to manage the, the, the fatalities better than we did when it early, early happened. The only reason this death rate is, is higher than it was in April is because the case rate is tremendously higher. We have so many more, had so many more cases than we had back in April. Um, but back in April, we didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't know how to treat it. We didn't have the therapeutics. We didn't have the controls. Um, even, even just the infrastructure of the hospital, we, we learned a lot going into that whole thing. So that's why we came down dramatically over the summer and that's why we were able to control the death rate uh, going into November, December. The insert shows Lancaster and I just wanted to point out here, it's really just similar trends. There's nothing significantly different. If you went to most counties throughout uh, Pennsylvania, you'd see that similar kind of shape on the trending graph. Next one, Dave. So now let's get into, real briefly, let's get into testing because the testing um, still has to happen. We still have an 18% uh, positivity rate. We need to make sure the tests are available. The next slide, Dave. So there's two slides here and I'll go through pretty quickly. We do have, we, all the testing we did early on um, back in, I think it was December. 
Uh, December, we centralized it to the, for all of Lancaster County at the Public Safety Training Center near Stabuki Nook. <clears throat> that's continuing. <clears throat> um, we think that's gonna be able to be um, discontinued maybe as early as the end of the month and we'll get back to just providing that at our normal venues of the urgent care and primary care sites. But here's the, here's the, um, the, the frequently asked questions on the right-hand side and, and I'll make sure you guys will have this, Kathleen or, or Marshall and team will make sure we send it out to you and you'll have this available to you. Um, but the, the big message here is if you, if you have any kind of respiratory symptoms or you're feeling ill, don't hesitate, uh, contact your doctor and let them diagnose. They'll, they'll be able to figure out whether or not they have to do tests. And for the most part, most of our primary care physicians can provide the test right there in their offices. You don't have to go to a central location anymore. So, um, so that's, that's just a quick um, uh, notification for you. The next slide, Dave, please. This kind of breaks it down and, and it's just for reference for you. Ultimately, we can test for anything. You don't have to worry about, am I eligible for a test? Look, if you're sick, go to your, your family doctor, let them diagnose you. We have multiple reasons where we can do the test, whether you're symptomatic, you're doing some, some if you're doing some traveling, you need to get tested. If you've um, been a contact tracing case, we'll test you for that. Um, all that's available at any of our venues. So we can, we can expedite those testing. And right now, I think the testing is taking like on average, like an eighth of a day. Um, so we did a great job throughout the entire um, term to make sure that we never got above uh, two days before the results came back. And now and on average, on average it's, it's, it's within the same day, less than 24 hours. Okay, next slide, Dave. Therapeutics, this is important to understand. So aside from the vaccine, there has been tremendous work on treating people um, who have, who have uh, newly acquired COVID. So next slide, Dave. So monoclonal antibodies. So the whole concept of monoclonal antibodies is for those individuals that, that have acquired COVID and are at a high risk level and have the risk factors identified there based on age, body mass index, maybe some chronic conditions that you have, all of these, if you have COVID and are a high risk, you are eligible for this monoclonal antibody. And essentially what that is, is you're basically not waiting for your body to create its own antibodies. We're injecting it directly into you from, some, from someone that had it and they're able to process that and basically fast track the antibodies directly in your system. This is extremely limited availability. So that's why it's limited to those high risk. And even the high risk, I can't tell you today, but I know that early on, we had so little that we had to randomize those that were eligible because we couldn't give it out to everybody. Um, so right now that continues to be available at our urgent care centers. And I think that I think the volume is getting better, but it's still very limited. Um, I do think that, I think that um, WellSpan also has this, um, but it, it's incredibly limited. Most health systems do not have um, access to this. Next slide, Dave. This is a breakdown of it. I'm not gonna go through details. There's actually two more slides that I spared you guys, but the essence, what I wanna show you, and this is a really good slide to show you not just what the monoclonal antibodies do, but just vaccines in general. And so what you're looking at, if you start at the top there, you're talking about the vaccine. I'm going to go into that in a minute, how it attacks the virus. And it, it, it basically initiates your own immune system to create its own antibodies. Well, look at that on the left-hand side there. What we're doing is we're bypassing your body's need to create its own. And we're just injecting it directly. And it attacks the COVID virus right away at an incredibly effective rate. Let's go next slide, Dave. So this is a study we did early on internally at LG just to understand how effective the monoclonal antibodies were. And so we, we did, um, like I mentioned before, we had a randomized because it's a limited sample size. So like any good scientific organization, we're monitoring that along the way. And so we had 108 people that received the antibody and we had close to 2000 that didn't because you, you know the, the, the limitations we had. We made sure the age was about the same, but look at what happened. So the admissions, we had three people that had that, out of that 108, three people got admitted to the hospital. 
one for cellulitis and uh, one was unre unrelated. And 241 out of the 2,000 went in the hospital that didn't get it. So the admission rate was significantly different, only 2.8% versus 12.1. The length of stays of those in the hospital was far less. But look at the death rate. The death rate was 0% for those that got the infusion and 2% that did not get the infusion. So it was a slam dunk that we knew we needed to ramp this up and spread it because it was such a good treatment for those that were high risk. And it, I mean, it just prevented a lot of death. Then the vaccination. So one more slide, Dave. So I'm gonna give you kind of the rundown of how the general um, vaccines work. Um, this is critical. And, and if, there's, if there's a message to take away, Nicole's gonna do a great job of giving you the understanding of what to do from, from the safety and well being standpoint. But right now, everybody's very excited about the vaccine. The vaccine only works if we get vaccinated, right? It only works if we can reach that herd immunity, which means that people have to be willing to get the vaccine. So for all of us to get it, if we don't attain that 60 plus percent rate in the community, that virus still is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna spread. It's like, it's like partially putting out a forest fire. If there's still enough there, it's still gonna, there's enough, enough uh, tinder that's gonna allow it to catch and it's gonna, it's gonna reflame itself. And we're gonna see ourselves back in the mess back in when September, October hits, just like flu season does, right? When it comes around, it's not a new virus. It just stayed here. It stayed here through the summer, just like it did last year and it took off and we need to avoid what happened in November, December this year, where we had this dramatic spike up and it caused a lot of the shutdowns that occurred. The only way we're gonna do that is if we optimize while the virus is being controlled. So the best message we can get out there is the safety of the vaccines. And this vaccine is literally as safe as has ever been made in history. And I'll go through the mechanism in just a minute. So ultimately you're looking at, you probably heard this, so I'll just fast forward through it. It identifies the spike protein. The spike protein is what is replicated and it causes the mRNA. The mRNA will then tell your body, it's, it, literally it's called the messenger RNA. What it does is just tells your body, here's how you replicate it. I don't want you to take the virus and fix it. I want you to, I want to tell you, I'm going to give you a, a map of how to make it in your own body with your own stuff. So it's not, there's no DNA, there's no live virus, there's nothing you can get from it. It's just, you're telling your body what to do. And then the mRNA that came in there, it leaves. It comes in, the vaccine comes in, tells your body what to do, and then it, it goes away. I mean, it's amazing technology. And this, this whole, this whole, um, this aspect was created at Penn decades ago. So it's great that we we have this available to keep us moving forward. The next slide, Dave. So it is, like I mentioned, it's incredibly safe and very effective. It, it's, it's, um, it's as high as the measles vaccine, which has become the gold standard for vaccinations. So it's incredibly effective. You can see the breakdown of the first dose, second dose, and we can have a discussion about you know the deployment of whether you know, everybody gets a first dose or you try to maximize the first and second. So, so the country and the state have decided that they're gonna focus on giving everyone first and second doses by phases. And that's moving ahead. And I'll give you an update on that shortly. The part we need to dispel are these myths. These myths are gonna get out of control if we don't, if we don't keep preaching the accurate kind of statement. So like I mentioned before, there is no live virus. You can't get COVID-19 from the vaccine itself. Um, it does not cause infertility. It, it does not enter your DNA. It does not disrupt the nucleus of your DNA. So you've heard a lot of those and all of them are impossibilities. Um, so just wanna share that. And then the effectiveness at 95% is, is virtually unprecedented. Next one. These are the side effects. So I'm sure some of you have already gotten the vaccine. So you guys can tell, and I, I have too, because we're in the hospital, Nicole has as well. Yeah, that, that day one, uh, the first shot of the, is not really bothersome. It's pretty normal. These are some side effects that have gotten. Um, day two, the second vaccine is a little bit more. 
that next day, 24, 48 hours, you're pretty well wiped out. It feels like a very mild, mild flu. Um, so you just have to be aware of that. The key one on this side that I wanna point out is on the right-hand side. So when we get into how risky is it on the reaction rate, it's absurdly low. Reaction rate, the risk of getting any anaphylaxis from this vaccine for both, whether, whether um, Moderna or Pfizer is in the case per million. So I, have, I made sure I pointed out 0.00025, 0.00047. It is a ridiculously low rate that you can get any degree of anaphylaxis. Yes, people are always sore. You will feel a very mild flu, but I promise you, it is a thousand times better than getting the COVID virus. You would take this in a heartbeat. And compared to the flu, it is ridiculously calm and easy. So um, that's the side effects. Next slide, Dave. The J&J &J, um, was, was um, issued uh, EUA on, on February 27th. That's no ramping up. We've already started, not we. Um, you know, the governor made a focus that he was gonna have the J&J &J deployed to the schools and all the staff at the schools that's already started through the IU as has created a lot of that. Um, he's also, uh, I think the latest one he did last weekend, um, he's trying to extend that to certain um, food and manufacturing. He's gonna make that available to them. So the mechanisms aren't quite clear yet, um, but that's the plan. The plan is to reserve the J&J &J vaccine for those uh, cohorts. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. So they get the phase, the phase plan. So the phases, the governor set up, or the DOH uh, for Pennsylvania set up these multi-phases and 1A, 1B, 1C, and 2. <clears throat> 1A, the focus was the people that care for, for the sick and the people that are most vulnerable, right? That's the group that they wanted to, to get in as soon as possible. So it's the residents of long-term care facilities, age-related 65 and older, and then those that are less than 65 that have comorbidities, they're eligible. Healthcare workers, including not just hospital, any healthcare workers. We're talking ambulance drivers, EMS, um, you know, the, all, the, all the retirement communities we have in this county, um, which is a tremendous number of people. <clears throat> all of that is phase 1A. Getting into phase 1B and 1C gets us into those essential kind of um, uh, commercial areas. So, so looking at um, manufacturing food, agricultural, um, had originally education workers, but they bumped up a little bit, um, even clergy and support for the, for the for house of worship. So all of that is in the phase 1B. So we're trying our best to get the 1A um, as soon as possible so we can move through the other phases very quickly. Next slide, Dave. So everybody, I mean, I can't say, I mean, employers and I outreach are, are eager to know when are we going to be through with the 1A and when can we get to the 1B? So let me just, let me just give you a sense for the math, right? Let's just think math. In the math side, we know that there's more than 200,000 eligible 1As in this county. This county has an abundance of retirement communities. It is a healthcare mecca. There's a lot of elderly. There's a lot of healthcare workers. It is an enormous amount of people. If we were to get the, the county, we have the, we have the county site now, which, which is on target to generate up to 6,000 vaccines a day. If by chance we could do 6,000 vaccines a day starting tomorrow, we still wouldn't get 200,000 done until June, just by the math alone, right? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And the J&J &J is helpful because now we have a completely separate cohort that isn't in this math. That's gonna help expedite that a lot quicker, which is fantastic. Um, but it's, it's a huge um, undertaking. So let me give you an update of where we stand with all of that. Let's go, Dave, next slide. <coughs> So this gives you a sense for the vaccinations throughout the state. You can see there on the left-hand side, the distributions of how, the, how each county is doing. So Lancaster is there, I don't know, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight county um, when it comes to partially in full. So we're doing a good job. Um, has nothing to do with us, frankly. Um, it's, it's a matter of how many vaccines we get. So we have, I'm pretty sure, Nicole, we have virtually every practice, every urgent care, 
that's registered vaccinations and we we ask for vaccines literally every week um, and we get what we get. Sometimes we've asked for 5,000, we've gotten 2,500. We've asked for 2,500, we've gotten nothing. So, um, so it's been all over the place. And it's not, I would, it's not like the state has a surplus. They don't, they get it, they do the exact same thing. They get what they get, they distribute it. So, so I just wanna make sure everyone understands like there's no surplus in Lancaster, there's no surplus in the state when we get the vaccines, they're pretty much gone in three days. And then we, we request every week, we request the same, same amount. So during the winter, <clears throat> during those bad weather days for the, for the country, when they had, you know, they had the, um, the terrible snowstorms in Texas and, and some of the cold, there were literally trucks that left the, the distribution centers in Kentucky and had to turn around and go back because they weren't confident they were gonna make it here um, and you'd lose all those vaccines. So in those weeks, we got nothing. Um, so I just want to give everyone an understanding logistically, like it's a, it's a tremendous feat to get these um, out to the counties um, that quickly to be able to distribute them um, throughout the, the area. But we're making great progress. Let's go next slide, Dave. So these are the trends and I just want to share this with you. So I'll give you Pennsylvania and Lancaster, very similar trends you can see there that so far by age group, you can see obviously the highest, highest amount, so that's 65, 70, 75 year olds, which is what's supposed to be. So they're doing the right thing. Those that are below 60 are predominantly healthcare workers and those that are at risk. So we are hitting the cohort that's needed to be, to be addressed. So that's, that's outstanding. You can see there's a steady climb. So overall the state is getting better um, day by day on distributing more and more. Um, and the forecast, you're gonna see this increase um, dramatically in the next uh, couple of weeks. Next slide. So the same similar, very similar trend in Lancaster. We're doing an even better job of hitting those 65 and older um, and, and controlling those that are younger. And we still have that same gradual climb. You can see, you can see on the left-hand side, those dailies, you see those really dramatic like voids there. Those were those bad weather days where we didn't get the, the vaccines and couldn't put it out there, but we're still making some really great progress. The next slide, Dave. So it comes down to the community vaccination center and I'm just kind of looking ahead, make sure I have, uh, go down here for you. Yep, all right, so community vaccination center. First, and I think still only center that um, serving the public as a collaboration amongst multiple health systems, which is fantastic. We've got you know, Penn, um, Penn State, UPMC, Wellspan, and it's all been facilitated by the Rock Littis team who are absolute experts, when it, global experts when it comes to creating events in credit, with incredible efficiency. That's what they do. So we immediately look to them to help to create this and it's going tremendously well. We had the governor there on the first day of opening um, he was incredibly impressed and supportive. We've had our county commissioners and our state reps and state senators have done a great job of advocating for Lancaster to be the, the model moving forward, and it's paid off. Um, let's go to the next slide, Dave. So what you see here, and I've, I've identified in red, so we've had, so there's been over 10,000 doses that we got this last week. So prior to that, we were getting 2,500, maybe up to 5,000. We got over 10,000. So if you've heard the news today, literally today, we're increasing our daily dosages to 1,500 a day, and we're just trying to get more staff. And so TriStar has done a fantastic job of, of taking this within weeks and creating this, this kind of uh, new distribution center, and, and we've done a great job of rolling it out. So we're doing well. We still have our own do, uh, dosages at the uh, health campus, the 2,000 Moderna dosages. So that allows us to get those targeted uh, groups that are under our control to get them uh, fast track those services. But, but the, um, the, the focus that we're trying to do is to drive people to the vaccination center, which is why we try to make sure people don't even, don't even come register on our site. We're having them all go to the vaccinatelancaster.com site to register, get all their information. We've been very careful as a health system not to create our own messaging. 
If you go on the LG website, you'll see a ton of links that take you back to the DOH, CDC, and now Vax St. Lancaster because it changes so quickly. And, and we just wanna make sure we weren't mismessaging anybody. So we wanna make sure we got everyone right to the source so they can trust us that we're gonna we're gonna message appropriately, but we're gonna link them to the source of the message itself. And we've been very true to that uh, since the get-go. Um, yeah, next slide. So this is a listing of the key links that we have down and, and you can have this and share it with your staff and put it out there. Um, it goes, even, I even have two videos at the bottom, which are really great vaccine messaging for your staff, family, and friends to be able to understand the safety of the vaccine. Cause that's the message we have to get out there. We've got the mechanism to distribute it. We, we have, we have got what could be the, one of the best in the country, as long as we continue to filter in the appropriate doses. Um, the other message that we wanna make sure is if anyone does not, any of your, if you're in your staff or family or friends, don't have a medical home, don't have a family doctor, get one. Because then it's a shared accountability on us that we have to outreach to you and provide all of that. If you don't have that, first of all, if you get sick, you have nowhere to go. Like you have to go to urgent care and it's a little bit more awkward. Um, but if you have, have someone as a medical home, we will help watch it for you. We will message you. We have our proprietary Myology Health account. We can actually literally text you when you're ready to go and get your vaccine. So we can do all that. Um, so if you don't have a medical home, get one, um, find us, and we'll, we'll be happy to do that for you. All right, that's pretty much the rundown of where I am. I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Nicole, which is gonna give you a, a quick update on the safety and well-being, and then we'll, we'll open the floor for some questions and answers. All right, you can go to the next slide, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having us. So I wanna talk just a little bit about this morning, um, just high level overview of employee safety and how to keep, especially like your retail market safe. So from the employee side, one of the things you definitely wanna start with uh, is doing temp screenings at the start of the shift. I would even probably take it a step further and maybe do some questions such as, you know, have you been told to quarantine in the last 14 days? Is there anybody in your house waiting positive? or um, test results. These are all things that we as employees of the health system go through every morning when we come in and we have to attest to as well. Um, employees should report any symptoms to the supervisor or an owner immediately. You need to create that culture where they're not afraid to say I'm sick. Um, you know, we've seen it in many of our other industries that we work with where that is not necessarily the culture and it creates outbreaks. You need to make sure that you are promoting that culture of safety if you're sick, stay home, um, you know, and maybe that's in leave policies, you know, depending on what you offer to your employees, but we, we want them to feel comfortable saying I'm sick and they're not going to be, um, you know, penalized for staying at home. Provide masks for employees to wear. This isn't so much of an issue. This was an issue back in the beginning when, you know, nobody had them, everyone was scrambling to get them or make them. Um, most people probably have their own at this point and cloth masks for the most part, um, for probably the large percentage of what you all are doing are sufficient. Uh, provide space for breaks and meals that allow a physical distance of six feet. Um, it's great that you wear your PPE all day long when you're with each other, but the second you go to lunch, if you're at lunch together um, and you're within you know, that six feet window, you're now eating, your masks are down. That's one of the most vulnerable um, times for employees. We've seen that in our system as well prior. Um, early on. So make sure you're providing space uh, that allows for that six feet distance. And ideally, if possible, stagger their lunch shifts, depending on, you know, how big your staff is. Allow frequent hand washing breaks as well, especially for the retails dealing with cash. Um, and CDC recommends at least once every hour. And make sure that you have um, established processes for your COVID-19 exposures. So how do you contact trace? What does it mean? Um, cleaning and disinfecting guidelines and keeping up on quarantine and isolation guidelines, which seem, which seem to change daily, especially now with, you know, they're taking into account fully vaccinated individuals. Uh, so just making sure you're up to date on all of those exposures and making sure you have a clean process for all of those as well. Next slide, Dave. So I'm going to focus specifically on the retail guidance. Um, so encourage, still encourage, even though, you know, things are opening back up, Still encourage the online or phone-in ordering with curbside pickup or delivery. 
If practical, you can conduct your business by appointment. Um, most capacity restrictions right now are at 75% unless you're in the, like the entertainment um, business of gyms, um, you know, some uh, movies, bowling, like that kind of stuff. Most of your stores though are back to the 75% capacity restriction. Uh, require that customers wear masks, put the uh, sign on the door, you know, no mask, no entry kind of thing. Obviously the exception is children under two and over two with medical conditions. Uh, frequently disinfect high touch surfaces. So door handles, um, the next bullet down is assigning an employee to sanitize any hand baskets or carts that you might have. Just making sure all of those continuously are um, sanitized, the credit card machines, that kind of thing. If possible, and if, if your space allows, um, if you have more than one register, alternate your checkout registers, um, install a barrier at the checkout between the employee and the customer and provide the visual cues at checkout that promote a six foot distance. Next slide, Dave. And I think the biggest thing and, uh, that I kind of want to focus on is to educate and support your employees. We've been doing this for you know a year now, which is kind of crazy to think about, um, but for a lot of people, um, I'll give you an example. I just did a drug test yesterday on one of the patients that came into the office. You could tell she was a little skittish to be in the room with me in the lab, which is a decent size. Um, and then she finally disclosed that outside of grocery shopping, this was literally her first time out anywhere else in a year. She was very scared. Um, so I think making sure that we're there to support our employees. So starting with providing up-to-date education and training on COVID-19. I think it's very important. We need to focus on the facts of COVID. As T kind of mentioned earlier, there's a lot of myths out there about the vaccine. Um, there's, you know, a lot of varying degrees of, um, you know, how people believe in the science and the, the masking and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So focus on the facts. I think as a business, you need to know your risk, know where your, your, um, your areas of concern might be, and then practice prevention in the right way. Uh, the next one would be to provide the education and training um, on your workplace controls to your employees. So tell them what they're, you know, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. And this is why we're doing it. You know, keep them involved in that process. Uh, any training materials that they have, make it easy to understand and accessible. This is where we come to the, make sure it's um, a, the appropriate languages are available and a literacy level. Um, it's easy to read. Establish a communication plan to receive and respond to employee questions or concern. I think this is very important to, um, you know, create that culture where if they have a concern about how something is being handled for COVID or, you know, certain scenarios, make that a, a welcoming environment and not, um, not a punitive one. And I think the biggest thing, again, is to be present to support your employees. There's, you know, concerns vary with every individual. Maybe they're immunocompromised. Maybe they have someone at home who's immunocompromised. There's financial concerns or they're just scared of the unknown. Um, so make sure that you're there to support your employees. Know that there's resources available. Um, you know, we can certainly help you with resources. There's tons of things available online. Um, and then at the bottom there, there's just some posters and signage that if you'd like to use them throughout your business, uh, they're from the Pennsylvania Department of Health, but they make them available for everybody. So feel free to take a look at those. Next slide, Dave. And then the last thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention on behalf of our wellness team, which is also work very closely with us, they have their mindful moments. So this is just kind of some snippets of ideas. Um, you know, take time and do this with your employees, especially if time allows, if you have a small group um, or, you know, one of the practices, it was just an idea. One of the practices the other day, instead of doing a, a huddle, they gathered for a huddle and then they sent their employees for a walk on 10 minutes just to kind of get outside and you know, kind of clear their minds. So just doing small things that really just help promote um, a healthy mindset because it has been a very challenging year. It's not over yet. Um, and like I said, you know, we all have a lot of concerns for various different reasons. So just making sure we're acknowledging that. I'll just, I'll just add before we kick it over, Marshall, for any questions is that I, I always point out, Nicole hinted to it, that, you know, our system has already been vaccinated. Right. I mean, I think we have 80 plus percent compliance on the vaccination on our medical staff alone. And um, we still wear masks. We still get temperature checks. We still keep distances. We don't do the meetings. We we are our staff. Are still, so we just don't. There's a lot we don't know about this virus. We don't know if you can get it again. We think we've had a couple of cases where we think you can get it again. Not after the vaccine, but after you get the 
the, the, the actual virus. We don't know if you can be an active carrier and for how long, even if you have the vaccine. There's just a lot of questions. But at the same time, we've been promote proponents all along to maintain an open economy. Um, if you comply with these precautions, we've never shut down, obviously, from the hospital system. And we've controlled the spread tremendously within our, our employees. We've got a very low employee infection rate. So it can be done if you can enforce compliance. And I think that's most of the message that Nicole had. But part of that enforcement is also caring for the individual, making them feel safe. So before any merchants are dealing with their customers, they have to first make to start with their own staff and make sure their staff feel safe um, and, and confident that, that, that their employer cares about their own well-being. So with that, uh, again, I thank you very much for your time. I hope that it was insightful and we're happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Uh, Teek, Nicole, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, yes, a, a lot of um, very insightful information. Um, I'm sure there's some questions out there. So um, why don't we open it up? Um, anyone, either raise your hand, um, feel free to use the chat or uh, shout it out. Tink, uh, are um, the pharmacies um, like Rite Aid, et cetera, are they receiving um, any, a certain amount? Um, people are spending time just putting in information daily to ascertain this. Um, can you answer that, please? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sandy. Um, so every, what the state originally created was that any individual provider would be authorized as a vaccinator. If you're authorized as a vaccinator, then you can essentially apply to receive doses. And so even in our own system, we don't apply as a, a LG system. We applied each and every individual practice. And what the state did is they start out by saying, well, we're gonna give vaccines to those that know how to give vaccines. So if you have a history of giving flu vaccines and a very effective one, we're going to favor you over somebody else that's brand new. And then they, it seems like they started to favor those that had, you know, certain at-risk populations, more prevalent populations, and they nudged them a little bit higher. So I can't tell you where the Rite Aid and CVSs and other ones are right now, um, but they're all applying individually. It seems what we've been told behind the scenes is that the state seems to be favoring what we've created here locally as kind of an aggregate center and really shifting focus from individual providers to macro health systems and saying, instead of me giving vaccines to each of the 26 different primary care centers in Lancaster General, we're gonna give you guys a big chunk of it and you figure out where it needs to go. And that's where it's gonna, so I'm not sure how that's gonna impact the pharmacies, but overall that's the mindset of the of the state right now. Okay, thank you. And I'll just add to that, Sandy. So we are on with phone call with the state at least weekly, if not almost daily. In fact, we were on with them just yesterday. Um, our our medical officer, Mike Rochinsky, is incredibly close to that DOH. He he talks to either the Secretary of Health or um, the Assistant Secretary of Health on a regular basis uh, because we are. We're, we're becoming kind of the, the, the beacon for, for, the, for the state trying to get things out there. So um, it's, it's been a really great response um, um, over the last couple of weeks. Alex, you had your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the positivity rate. You had mentioned 18% positivity rate. Does that mean 18% of people who are exposed to COVID will test positive? It means the, yes, the amount, no, it means the amount of tests that are done are coming, 18% of the tests that are done are becoming positive. Okay. So, so if you, and you increase that, either you're not testing enough because you want to be able to test enough negatives too, right? So if you test more, you should offset the positives with the negatives. But if you, if you have a prevalent testing and it's a high positivity rate, it just shows that there's not a lot of negatives. You, you have an infection rate that's just mm. out of control. And that's where we've been for, for most of the year. 
Um, we have not really kind of gotten ourselves down to that controllable amount. And we've done a fantastic job of testing. So it has never been a limitation of testing. It's always been that a, a basically an affirmation that, that, the, that the, the virus is alive and well. Okay, thank you. I hate to be the one to ask yet another question, but I do have one. Um, thanks to LGH, I work at Water Street Mission. We're considered healthcare workers because of our vulnerable population. So I was very blessed to be able to get my first shot. However, my husband is under 65, but with cardiac issues. We've gone, he's got at My LG Health, we've gone on to vaccinate Lancaster. Is there any benefit to his? primary care physician making a call to him or are we doing the right thing by doing what we've done that I just cited? You're doing the right thing and it comes okay. down to the right. It's perfect, Stan. That's a great example where you need to get on a registry if you're eligible. So what we've been trying to do is we're trying to limit the, the availability of the registry to only the 1As. Yes. Um, but like I mentioned, it's still the limitation of the of the vaccine. So what, what could very well happen in your husband's case is certainly we've just, just received last week the, the new dosage and we're trying to catch up. We've been catching up on some of the scheduling uh, that we've had um, at the health campus because of the limited amount of doses. So his time is absolutely coming and we will be outreaching to him either through the fact he's on both sites, so the vaccine in Lancaster or the Myalgy Health will notify him. And then they will discount each other wherever he gets his vaccine. Right. Now we, I'll Thank tell you, you. I'll, real quick to that. So, so like I think I mentioned before, the vaccine at Lancaster, because we had such significant, we had to we had to donate essentially 1,200 doses from Lancaster General just to start it up because it didn't get its own doses. So we donated to there, but because of the limitation and the enormous need in our county we had to randomize those. So for people that have been registered, literally every day, we randomize and based on how many doses we have, we tell them and say, your, your day has come. It's like a lottery, right? Your day has come, come on over, we'll take care of you. But we're not, we weren't, we could not pre-schedule because we did not know how many doses we were gonna get. And there's been some systems, I'll, I'll leave the names off, that have out of the gate, we're pre-scheduling people and had to completely cancel. And we've never gone that way because they're just, we just didn't know how many doses we were getting. But hopefully we get more and more. And we might even, what the state has hinted to us as of yesterday was they wanted to get all of the 1As actually scheduled by the end of the month. If that happens, then we get away from randomization because people have an exact day that they're gonna get their vaccine. So there's a lot up in the air, so more to come, and I'm sure there's going to be a public announcement that's going to happen within the week. Thank you so much. Any other questions for T or Nicole? So I'll just add, Marshall, so again, thanks everybody for having us. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us privately if you if you need anything. Uh, Nicole does an amazing job of, of helping customize any advice you might have for your location. If you need anything as a, as a, as a merchant or an employer, she does an amazing job with that. Um, and I too, if you, if you want some general information, um, my contact information is on here. Um, I encourage you to use the links because that's the best way to get the up-to-date. -date. It's so funny because like at, at times, you know, I'll comment to something and it changed like a half an hour ago and I, I don't know it just yet. So the links are incredibly reliable. I have a question. Please. Um, I was just curious, uh, this is Karen from the Demuth Foundation. Um, are you finding that there's a lot of no-shows with the appointments that people are making for vaccinations? Oh, that no. you have a surplus afterwards or no? That's a great question. I don't think so. I don't know. Nicole. Yeah, my daughter up in Ohio, was able to get one and she's only in her 20s because people weren't showing up to their appointments. It has happened um, day by day, but I'll tell you, we, like I mentioned before, when we get, we get the doses, they're gone in three days. 
And, and I think I honestly, it's one of those things that I'm taking for granted because I keep my hand out of the pot, but the group that's, that's doing the logistics are doing an amazing job. I can tell you one day early when I got my vaccine, I got it like five o'clock on a Friday and there was, I think there was maybe three cancellations and they expedited right away. It was, it was healthcare. So we could, we could get people from our hospital, but I haven't heard of any surplus um, at any of our PCP locations or, or the vaccine Lancaster. They could very well have people no show for one or another, but they've had a, such efficient uh, backup plans that they're able to expedite. They're not, it's not like they're searching for people. Um, I, I did hear um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, through social media, people are uh, giving tips on uh, how to uh, sign up for vaccines um, at let's say Rite Aid or uh, Walgreens um, it, anyone that has uh, late night appointments, um, very often that's when there are no shows. Uh -huh. And what you do is you just check in with that uh, on that website late at night because of there are people that don't make the 10 p.m. or whatever. And um, um, you can be added to the list at the last minute. Um, and people are, um, people are being encouraged to check, um, check the websites at those off hours. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, I, and it's not, it's not a, like, it's a lot. It's, yeah, it's yeah. random and it's only a few, but for, for the people are, who were having trouble finding spots for themselves, it was that little, that little chink of, of hope, uh, to, to find their spot yeah and prior to the, to the community vaccination center i mean yeah that's what people were doing but right now in all honesty i would just go on the vaccine lancaster if you're eligible and register and get your name there and there it's going to take off i mean the governor they're doing their best and you heard the president they're they're mass manufacturing right now so um you're going to see that ramp up real quickly excellent Any other questions? Great. Well, Nicole T. Again, thank you very much. Uh, we will be sending this uh, presentation out to uh, the larger um, group. It uh, it'll also be available um, via social media and our uh, and our website. Uh, so, um, thanks. Thanks, guys. Got it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Take care. Uh, Kathleen, do you want to do a quick uh, member intra marketing? Uh, absolutely. And by the way, we already do have this presentation loaded to our website, Marshall. Well, of course you do. <laughs> um, 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 the uh, member intermarketing uh, committee uh, met uh, uh, this month and we discussed uh, special presentation ideas for our uh, April merchant meeting. Uh, we are hopeful that we will have a special presentation on um uh, homeless outreach, um, and um, we are working with uh, Lanco My Home um, and some other community partners for a possible panel discussion presentation. Um, so um, look to your uh, email inboxes for news about that coming up. Uh, we're also hoping to roll out member spotlights. If you recall, member spotlights were a... Um, a reliable um, addition to every um, merchant meeting um, uh, agenda um, for years. Uh, we had to drop them once the pandemic hit because uh, we were concentrating on uh, timely issues of um, um, uh, news that we uh, needed to bring you updates about. And so um, many um, member spotlights for 2020 were literally just canceled in their tracks. Um, and now we're, we're planning to bring them back, especially um, member spotlights on local uh, businesses that have stories to tell you about um, uh, how they pivoted um, to meet the challenges that 2020 um, 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 hit them with. 
and they're really inspirational stories. We're hoping that the April me member spotlight will be offered by Zotropolis Cinema Stillhouse, um, which has a, a particularly unique and inspiring story uh, to relate. Um, we had um, quite a few welcome packets uh, to distribute. For those of you who are not aware, the uh, MIM committee distributes a welcome packet to every new business that opens. And 2021, um, as we're very much like 2020, is shaping up to be uh, a year when there are quite a few new businesses opening in the city of Lancaster. Um, we um, scheduled five um, welcome packets to be delivered to new businesses around the city. And also the committee discussed the importance of these welcome packets um, so that our, our new businesses don't feel a sense of isolation as new merchants in the city, especially during these COVID times when that is very possible. Um, uh, we discussed uh, the importance of a prompt delivery of the welcome packets being more critical than ever. Lori Herr, our team coordinator, uh, stressed the importance of a personal touch that it's so crucial for, on that first visit. And um, Kevin Malloy, who's really the star of delivering the uh, welcome packets for our committee, because he takes the time to um, uh, grab a picture of the new merchant and uh, so that we can use to give them a shout out on social media. So that's going to be um, sort of our best practice moving forward so that we can give them that extra bit of publicity anything that we can help them to get a really good start um, as um, a new business. Um, um, also our diversity and uh, equity and inclusion subcommittee uh, will be meeting tomorrow at 3 p.m. Thank you to all of the merchants uh, at the um, February merchant meeting that uh, signed up uh, to be included in that conversation. Um, everyone that signed up has indicated that they will be taking part in that meeting tomorrow. So we're really grateful for that participation. Um, and that's it for our, our report um, this month, Marshall and everyone. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes. Um, if anyone has anything um, that they would like to discuss or bring up, um, otherwise, we can go to our mornings. I have one question with the new guidance that are starting on April 4th, uh, based on the governor's announcement two days ago. Um, do we see any changes in um, activity downtown that would be related because of those um, changing guidance? I'm not sure I understand the question. The, so um, the uh, governor has, has uh, changed and uh, allowed like restaurants to have greater capacity. Um, the I believe you're no longer required to have food if you want to have a beverage uh, or alcoholic beverage. There is just some guidance has changed, and do we see that's going to change some of the activity in downtown Lancaster? Well, hopefully it'll mean a lot more people downtown. Is that <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't seen any sort of marketing to folks saying, hey, we're open, we're, you know, or any of the stuff that may coincide. Now, granted, it might be early because it's the 4th of April, but it was just something to, um, to think about that now that we have a new guidance, how does that implement and how does that change what's happening downtown? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point, Kevin. And, and, the, um, and that's something that I think um, the uh, Anne, who's not on the call, um, and Luke and others can, should, are having discussions about that. Um, I would like to remind everyone that um, this, is, this is the governor's announcement is perfect timing because a Lancaster City Restaurant Week is happening late this year, deliberately, and uh, will be taking place April 12th through the 18th. And it's a wonderful time um, to um, show your support for these restaurants who have been hit 
so hard, our restaurant and cafe community in the city of Lancaster and um, get out and enjoy the fact that you can um, um, dine safely both indoors and outdoors um, and take uh, advantage of some great specials at so many of our uh, restaurants and cafes in the city of Lancaster, April 12th through the 18th. And Perfect. Lancaster City Alliance is once again a proud sponsor of that event. Absolutely. All right, thanks, Kathleen. All right, everyone, if there is nothing else, uh, we will see you next month, if, if not before. Happy St. Patty's Day. Thank you. Bye. Nice green, nice green Laurie.